Hello, you're welcome to Dr. Abayomi Ajayi Live, and uh, my name is Dr. Abayomi Ajayi. And today we have an awesome discussion. We're going to be talking about how to use genetics to select healthy babies and family balancing. Well, there's a lot of stuff in there. And uh, to do justice to that, today I have in the house Dami Lola Atiba. So Dami will be telling us a lot about, you know, when we're talking about this, what we're talking about is the embryology laboratory. And so the best person to discuss it is the embryology. So Dami is the chief embryologist in Nordica, and she will be talking about all this. Of course, but let me just lay the background. Say so genetics, we know, is the study of genes, genetic variation, and heredity in organisms. And uh, now it has crept into IVF practice. Yeah, because since we started IVF that we needed to stimulate the women to give us many eggs, that means also that we have a lot of embryos to play with in the laboratory. But one thing people don't know most of the time is that majority of the embryos that we have in the laboratory cannot become babies. Yes. And so sometimes we, I hear, oh, doctor, I made five eggs. Why are you telling me that I, I'm not pregnant? And uh, I think today we'll be able to uh, let people understand some of these things that one thing is that eggs are not the same as babies okay because we know as many as about 75 percent of the eggs produced in the laboratory cannot mm -hmm. become babies yes. Yes. and the reason is not far-fetched I think is one of the things we'll be talking about today because errors do occur either it's transmitted from the egg or from the sperm or during the division when the two of them come together. And so that's why genetics is really has opened the door, floodgate for us to be able to identify some of these embryos that cannot become babies. So uh, maybe we should just start straight up. Jamie, tell us how genetics can be applied, one, to select healthier babies, and then also for family balancing. Okay, for genetics and IVF, we can actually use technology of genetics to select embryos before implantation, and that's the beauty of it. Before the psychological and emotional stress of what these errors cause, which I'm sure we'll get into later on. Now, in the laboratory, we have the luxury of looking at the embryos. Like doctor said, it is not all embryos that are normal. We will have abnormal ones, and there are implications for these abnormal ones. The implication is that if we do transfer them, it's either they do not implant, they lead to IVF failure, or they implant and then lead to miscarriage. Most of the time, that's what it causes. So we have the luxury of using genetics to select these embryos before transfer, using a technique called pre-implantation genetic testing, testing the embryos. Wonderful. Okay. Um, pre-implantation genetic testing. Okay. Yeah, when you were talking, you said it's either there is IVF failure or uh, there is miscarriage. miscarriage. Is it possible for some of them to escape what I like to call this quality control system in the body? Absolutely, absolutely. And then the way to explain that is the abnormal babies that we see around us. For example, Down syndrome. I'm sure we can all relate to that. Now, what has happened in that case is that there has been error, genetic error, due to one reason or the other most of the time it could be due to advanced maternal age the mother was at an advanced age um, at the time of conception so it is possible for although nature has a way of screening those things into miscarriage but it is possible to bypass like you said sir and then being comfortable with life having this syndromic children i also want our viewers to understand something that we're not talking only about IVF here we're talking about reproduction itself that these errors occur normally even when the baby comes from the bed as it were absolutely it's uh -huh. not um, it's not only related to IVF fantastic the advantage of IVF now is that we are able to identify these embryos that uh, carry these errors as it were that nature nature does make errors true <laughs> mm -hmm. and so uh, these are the things we are now able to identify these embryos and like you said we will not transfer them so tell us what are these pre-genetic uh, implantation of uh, testing what are the what kinds do you have well we have two kinds one kind is the one we're speaking about today which is the pgs pre-implantation genetic screening 
where we look at the chromosomes to look for these errors and these abnormalities that we're talking about. The other one is about the PGD, um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. In this situation, we know that there's a problem and we are looking for what the problem is. For example, this is what we use for couples who are ASAS in terms of sickle cell in order to avoid that. But for what we are discussing today, we use PGS. PGS has two uses. One is to be able to select LD embryos. Uh, the second one is for us to do what we call the sex selection. There are two reasons why you want to do sex selection. One, it could be for genetic medical reasons. There are some conditions that happen sometimes. In order to avoid the condition propagating within the family, we have to choose a particular sex. If the condition is linked to X chromosome, we choose the male. If the condition is, is linked to Y chromosome, we choose the female. Another reason for us to do sex selection is for family balancing, whereby a couple or a family wants to have one gender over the other, probably having had one before. Mm. So there's uh, the medical reason and probably the social, if you like. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, kindly like and share this video. I'm, I'm sure there's so many people who will benefit from this discussion we are having today. Okay, so let's, since we're talking more of the PGS rather than the PGD, okay, do you want to probably uh, tell us in a language that the viewers can understand the difference between these two? I know you mentioned it, but I want it to be done in such a way that everybody can understand it. The difference between G PGS and PGD. PGS is like a screening whereby we say we want to look for something in a particular population. We don't know whether it is there or not. We just want to look for it. Whereas PGD is, we know who we are looking for and what we are looking for, and we go to that particular place mm. and that particular thing. I.e., for example, sickle cell. We know that it's sickle cell that this couple are battling with, and that's what we are looking for. But with PGS, we do not know. We know that there might be a problem. We don't know what that problem is and where that problem is. So we just search everything, hence mm. the name screening. Okay. So, and like you mentioned, the, if you, uh, the mother is advanced, advanced in age, age. Okay, what else? Repeated uh, implantation failure with high VF. Good. Repeated miscarriages, either natural pregnancy or with high VF. Good. Also, very importantly, with male factor, which is, this one is an uncommon reason that a lot of people do not know, but with male factor um, infertility, it's really very important. Well, you know, anytime male factor is mentioned, I, I get interested. And um, just like you said, many people don't know because this, the male factor infertility to me is very intriguing in the sense that IVF itself, if you ask me, is tilted towards one side. Most of the t time the man is neglected. Mm -hmm. Even when he has the problem, it's the woman who takes the drugs. And so when you talk, tell me why should you want to do PGS with male factor infertility? Why I said the an uncommon reason is because um, even with miscarriages, a woman might be having repeated miscarriages because of the man. And a lot of us do not know this. Uh, male factor infertility, like we know, is evolving every day. The knowledge is evolving. It's not only I have normal sperm counts. You, some people have even evolved from saying, oh, I'm ejaculating semen. Now they even say, oh, I've done my seminar fluid analysis. It's normal. It's not only that. There are so many things also. Uh, like the sperm DNA damage. The sperm can be damaged genetically and mm. that also can translate to the woman having repeated miscarriages. So um, if we do PGS, in order for us to screen the embryos, we can now pick the normal ones and leave the abnormal ones such that we don't have that occurrence of um, repeated miscarriages. Thank you so much. I hope. Uh, tell us now, how is this done? Because it sounds very high for gluten. How is this done, this PGS? How do you do that in the laboratory? Well, like I always tell clients is that um, we have to do IVF. Or, or fortunately or unfortunately, the way the technique is now, we have to do IVF because a lot of people say we are not battling with infertility. I mean, my wife gets pregnant. It's just that we have um, recurrent miscarriages, but we need to use IVF. Reason being that we are working, we need to work on the embryos outside the body mm. inside the laboratory so once we form the embryos from getting eggs or and sperm bringing them together we take a tiny little part of that embryo it, it it's like having um, a tribe 
when you take one person from that tribe, that person is representative of the characteristics of that tribe. Mm. For example, you're able to know, oh, the, for example, in Nigeria, you're able to know oh, Nigerians are black. So that, that's, that's the same way it is. We take a little part of that embryo to tell us genetically what is happening with that embryo. It will give us information. Either the embryo is normal or abnormal. Wonderful. So it's just a part of the embryo that you take. That we do take. You know, now this is a plain uh, devil's advocate. I know sometimes some people ask you, are you sure my baby will not be missing one, one eye? Arm or one leg, yes. <laughs> yeah. we, we get that question a lot. And it is valid because if, if we look at the way we said it, that we take a part of the embryo. But one thing, beautiful thing about doing this screening at, at this stage is that the embryo at that at that point, the cell, even when we take a part of it, the other ones are capable of compensating for development. It is pre-implantation. It has not implanted yet. Those cells would compensate for each other and become absolutely normal babies. Wonderful. And the part you take, actually, is not the part that it's becomes the baby. It's not the part that becomes the baby after Wonderful. all. Wonderful. Good. Now, one thing that is coming to my head is that, okay, I've had an abnormal baby. Okay. Um, what can I do to prevent a recurrence? One thing, like we said, is the PGS. The fact that someone has had an abnormal baby means has higher chances. Of having a recurrence either the person is young or old hmm. because there were some factors in the beginning that caused that abnormalities and those factors are still there meaning that that error can still occur so we would advise for this test to be done do IVF let's screen the embryos and then we know that we are transferring healthy embryos normal embryos wonderful now you kept saying I mean this is the second time age of the woman yes. is it only the woman does the man play a part in this is the age of the man relevant at all the age of the man is relevant and this is a very unpopular view that um, a, a lot of men do not know uh, but um, it is very true I mentioned earlier about sperm DNA damage it has been found that it becomes really high with advanced male age as well now we want to start looking at when a man is 40 years of age. By 45, it becomes really impactful. And there are some other things too that we take as our normal lifestyle that impacts all of those things. Now, drinking, smoking, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, mm. these are normal. When we are talking about lifestyle, a lot of times we, we concentrate on the women. We say, oh, you're having fertility, go and lose weight. But we do not look at the men. Mm. So some of those things do really come into play when we talk about the men as well. Wonderful. Now, um, this, okay, what I'm getting is that when you're talking about PGS, you're talking about the chromosomes. Yes, sir. You want to see that the number of chromosomes are Complete. normal. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and PGD, like you said, is a different scenario because you're looking at the genes. Okay. Can, is there a difference between? I just want us to be able to differentiate between chromosomes and genes to people who are not scientists, for example. Okay. Um. Oh, sorry, before that, Riskat Folawiyo, Okurame Grace, Bumi Anifalaje, Bumi Hai, Plogzi Goodness, Adebola Folarin, Toby Benjamin, on Instagram, Toby, Toby T01, Talk to Vivi, Temira Deke, Bill Sholami, Leggy Cute. Okay, thank you so much for joining. Yeah. Okay, so, um, in other for us to be able to um, choose the embryos, mm -hmm. uh, we need to look at them genetically and be able to choose the normal ones. Um, the difference between genes and chromosomes, yeah. uh, for example, I would like to say that if you look at Nigeria as a country, I am a citizen of Nigeria. Yeah. So chromosome is the country, Nigeria. Gene is me, a citizen of Nigeria. So the gene is a part of the chromosome, while the chromosome is the whole part, is okay. the whole 
Okay. That's what we're so doing. you have to get to the chromosome before you see the gene. Before we see the gene. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, if from that, from that analogy, uh, will will I be right to say that it's more difficult to do PGD than do, to do PGS? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason being that seeing as gene is a unit of a whole. Now it is. I would just like to bring it home to say it is easier for you to find something bigger than something that is smaller sure. when you are in a large space. That's so right. that just answers the question. Okay. Now, how accurate are the results of this? You know, you told us that for PGS we could use it to look at the chromosomes yes. and they can tell us whether the chromosomes are normal and they can also tell us the sex. Yes. Okay. So let's look at PGS. If you're using it for, let's say, either of these two things, how accurate will the result be? The technology itself of being able to select is as accurate as 99%. It's very accurate, pretty Fantastic. accurate, um, if we look at um, the benefits of it. But it is also still subject to the success rate of IVF vis-a-vis -vis the age of the woman. Okay. Uh, we collected the okay, I'm still coming to that. I, I, we, I, because that's a, that's one top interesting thing I find about this whole selection, um, PGD and PGS. Okay, fine. Uh, so you, it's about 99%. So I can go to the bank if you tell me it's a boy. Almost. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 99%. Uh, now, so my question now will come to that. If I do PGS. Oh, by the way. Um, was it yeah today yesterday it was released that the in the uk that the success rate of ivf if you are less than 35 your big uh, baby uh, take home baby rate. rate is about 30 percent 35 percent maybe and um, because we get this problem all the time people especially in nigeria and i understand because in nigeria you have to pay every penny out of pocket as much as possible people just want to do one cycle and succeed mm -hmm. but i tell them all the time the technology doesn't work that way you need to be prepared for how the technology works now will selecting the embryo increase the success rate of ivf there are many ways to explain it um, i'll start first by saying yes but i would explain because we are choosing normal embryos it would help us to, there has been some studies to say that it would help to increase the pregnancy rate. It would also help to decrease the time to achieving pregnancy, which is also very important. Because, for example, if we have to do probably three cycles and in, implantation failure, PGS can shorten that time, the time that that person does, a number of IVF cycles that that person does. And it can also reduce miscarriage rate from what you said initially. Rate. Good. So, um, so, so, can you put a figure to it? Let's say, if without IVF, um, success rate is X, and uh, without PG, uh, PGT, without PGT yes. success rate is X. With PGT, success rate can be Y. With PGT, success rate can be X plus twenty five percent, about twenty five. Wonderful. So it's like almost times two. Yes. Fantastic. So PGS screening for the embryo can re but why is it not a hundred percent? If you are putting a normal embryo, just like you said, why is it not a hundred percent? Yeah, that, that's the answer <laughs> is why is IVF not a one? Because it it is not only healthy embryos that determines pregnancy. Mm. There are a lot of factors which we are still battling with, which is why IVF is still not a hundred percent because there are so many things to battle with. Even after transferring that healthy embryo into the woman's womb, there are a lot of crosstalk that has to happen between the embryo and the womb that we still do not understand a lot of things. Yeah. So people the fact that you are oh okay, we have a question on Instagram. What happens when you discover abnormality after the screening? Rosemary yeah one of the things that um, people need to know when doing pgs is the possibility of having abnormal embryos because we are looking for something we're bound to find it hmm. now ethically and um, 
clinically, we would advise not to transfer that embryo because we know that um, the embryo, we've said that the embryo is abnormal. So we do not advise for such embryos to be transferred. You know, many years ago, um, when we were not doing it in Nigeria, I remember very well, there was a gentleman that came from a part of Nigeria to Lagos. And then we referred him to somewhere, not in Nigeria, to do the procedure. And he came back storming my office. Because, and they brought a report because no embryo was fit for transfer. So, I mean, you just told us now that you, you recommend that such embryo should not be transferred. So how can we safeguard such things that we don't have a situation where the gentleman came to my office. Fortunately, I was not the one who did it, so I could tell him that, look, let me get in touch with your doctors here, and then we'll have a chat. But I saw the report that nothing could be transferred. So how can we make sure that, or try to, to avoid such, avoid such situation. situations? One is, it starts from the number of embryos that we start to analyze in the first place. We try as much as possible to say the more number of embryos we have, the better our chances of selecting what we want. It's like a probability game, throwing a dice, and we want a particular number. The more throws we have, the more chances we have of getting that particular number. So we always advise clients that. We also advise clients to be prepared that it's likely to do more than one IVF cycle, especially when age is over 35, 35 and above, because um, of the peculiarity of the number of embryos, number that will come out abnormal mm. versus number that will come out normal. I, I think that's a very important point because when you have, you s many people you see they are 38, they are 39, yes. and they want to do this. Physiologically, they are not likely to produce many eggs to even start with. But you need many embryos in order for you to be able yeah. to do that. So it's important that they, from the get-go, they might need to do more than one IVF cycle. And that really, because of the cost involved sometimes also, brings a lot of discussions. But I think, just like you said, for us to avoid that kind of situation, because it's worse when you don't even have anything to transfer. So it's better to start with as many things as possible before uh, we, we embark on the journey at all. Now, okay, we've talked about uh, PGS, we've talked about PGD, okay. Yeah, we're talking about to select healthy embryos, but you also said something that is not going to be a hundred percent. And one of the reasons is that there are so many other factors. For example, the uterus itself is a factor. I mean, here in Nigeria, in Africa, we have a lot of uterine fibroids, and that also affects success, success rates. Rate. You know, we we have we we did a study here. We saw that sixty-one percent of the patients that we we looked at over 1,000 people. We saw that the over 61% of the people that we looked inside the, the uterine had abnormalities in their uterine. So definitely there are uterine conditions also that are associated with this fact that we can't get a 100% success rate. But is, can genetics also be used in other ways, probably to increase success rate, for example? Yes, there, there are lots of other things. So, for example, we have what we call the ERA test, endometrial receptivity assay test. Now, um, just from what we were saying, the fact that there are some uterine factors. We also know that um, routinely in IVF, we do transfer at day three or day five, but studies recently have shown that all women are not equal. Mm -hmm. There's what we call implantation window, meaning that the time frame that the womb is most receptive to accept embryos in, to implant, either through IVF or even naturally. So it is not one size fits all. This test would be carried out and then we'll be able to say, oh, this is a particular time that this particular woman has optimal window of implantation that would also help to improve implantation rates. At that point, it's not as if we're um, shooting and miss. We know it's going to be precise. The embryo transfer is going to be precise in terms of timing. We also have what we call the um, product of conception test, which addresses miscarriages, um, the reason for miscarriage. We can analyze the product of conception, do genetic tests on it, and then it can come back to tell us that either the embryos are normal or abnormal then we know that we have eliminated one thing in terms of the cause of the miscarriages okay fantastic 
Um, one one thing about era is uh, okay. Maybe this is not the discussion for era. So let's go to uh, go back to uh, let's talk about ethics. Let's talk about ethics. Is there this are uh, they, they sound interesting? Are there any pitfalls? Because one of the problems is with technology is that the fact that you can do it does not mean you have to do it. You have to do it, yes. Exactly. So there are ethical guidelines. Is there any ethical uh, slippery slope with this uh, PGT? One thing which um, is ethics and um, it has been around for so long is the fact that are we wasting embryos? Hmm. Because the technology that we use is like I mentioned, ninety-nine percent is still not a hundred percent. So what happens to that um, is zero point one percent that we could misdiagnose and say that they are abnormal when they are normal. Mm. And there's also the issue about mosaism. It's a bit technical, but it's real in embryos. Whereby, like I said, we take a part. What if that part is? Is it is, is exactly, not in Nigeria? It, is it Ghanaian exactly. living in Nigeria? So. Um, <laughs> Some people, even normally, a lot of people do not know that um, genetically we can even carry two set of things that yeah. we, do, we really do not know. So even in taking the embryos, is it possible that the land that we took from, the part of the embryo we took from, it's telling us a, a different thing than what the embryo is. So ethics will say, are you wasting embryos? Hmm. You know, one, I, 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 I don't know whether we have time for this, but one thing that you just said, Nada, there was, there was a particular case where there was a divorce case. And um, the so the the uh, man uh, the woman sued the man that he wanted child support. So they had to do the DNA of the children. And then that was when the trouble started. The father was the father of the children, but the mother was not the mother of the children. Mm -hmm. And so they said, "Oh, this is a scam." And they said maybe the man is also complicit. Okay. And then, fortunately, the woman was pregnant at the time that the problem started. So when they were in court, oh, she was pregnant. So they now said, when they now said that she was not the mother of the children, she, of course she freaked out. So the, she now, the, our own lawyer now asked that, okay, fine, this woman is pregnant this time. Let the court be there when she delivers. And so the court was there, was represented when she delivered. They did the child's DNA again. She was not the mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only for them to see that she was actually a twin when she was in her mother's, in our mother's womb. So Aubrey was her own sister that never came. Genetics is showing us a lot of things. And I, I think it's the is the way to go. It's just the way to go now. And uh, I'm sure it's going to show a lot more as we go about. So we have talked about ethics. Yeah, but one thing that also people ask is that this freezing, that you, because for you to be able to do this testing, what it means is that you must be able to freeze the embryos. Yes. Okay. And that's one of the things I tell people that if a clinic cannot do good freezing, they have no business doing this procedure that we're talking about because we need to be able to freeze. But the question really is even that will this freezing not affect the babies? So far, I, I get that question a lot and I explain to say so far we haven't had any form of studies to say that there's any abnormality that frozen embryos, children from frozen embryos have um, higher abnormality compared to those who, do not, who are not frozen or even to natural. So there's there's no effect. So, so yeah, people can do the tech. They, they can use the technology. There is nothing to show that. Rather, you you can come up with a baby that is even healthier, as it were. Yeah. One one other thing. Okay, Victoria Chibuzo, what's the maximum number of embryos that can be tested at once if a lot of embryos are produced? The technology itself. There's no maximum number of embryos. There's no minimum even. Um, you can test one embryo, you can test 100 embryos. But in terms of the process, that's when we say that, like I mentioned earlier, we say have an optimum number of embryos. We say that from six upwards, but there's no maximum. The more, the, more, the merrier. Mm. 
Mm. And these are the five embryos anyway. They are blastocysts. Yeah. What is the rate of fertility? Why is the rate of fertility getting low with ages below 40? Did we say anything like that? It's just a general it's question. Just a general it, it, question. It, it, it must be the law of diminishing returns that um, unfortunately women have to deal with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have been using a car for 40 years, I mean, mm -hmm. come on, you expect some bolts and nuts to come off. Yes. I think mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just dimin diminishing returns. Okay, well, maybe do we still have one more question for this? Is just I find this very interesting because I think this might just be where the world is still going to go to. We've seen that there is a patient that has, I mean, she's survived for over one year now after gene editing for sickle cell disease. Okay. Victoria Gray. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what do you think about gene editing? Is this something that you think we should look forward to or something we should run away from? Um, we're running now, but we may eventually look forward to it uh, because uh, it brings in itself a solution. While PGS will screen and tell you there's something wrong, unfortunately, cannot do anything about what is wrong. So what gene editing can do is that, oh, we find something is wrong. Those bad genes, in quotes, that is making the embryos abnormal, let's remove it, for example, and then um, um, do something to repair it so that that abnormal embryo can become normal. Um, like every technology, when a fox comes out, uh, there's some certain resistance. So I look forward to where this will go. Hmm. So thank you so much, Dami. I think, um, yeah. We've had a good discussion today, you, yeah, and um, I'm sure uh, people will understand more about genetics and the role it can play in assisted reproduction, and the role it's playing now and the role it can play in future. So, thank you so much for being part of this program today. We we'll see you in another two weeks, and uh, please stay safe. Corona is still very much around with us, and I don't think it's going anywhere very soon. And of course, one of the things that they're using for Corona also is this genetics that we're talking about. Absolutely, it's yeah. been so much help. Yeah. Oh, 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 there is a last question. Is it advisable for someone with endometriosis to do the screening? Ah, well, damn, you can't run away. This, <laughs> take this last question. <laughs> someone with endometriosis to do the screening, yes. Uh, in fact, um, it could be one an indication because um, there might be speculation that Air quality might be uh, compromised with the condition of endometriosis. So, if air quality is compromised, embryo quality will be compromised. If embryo quality is compromised, we are likely to have higher abnormal embryos. So, it could help. Yeah, thank you so much. And no more questions. So, <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Bye.